Good day, everyone. Today, you, we will be discussing the water quality, which is one of the vital components in operating a hatchery. So in this lecture discussion, we will be discussing basically the fundamentals of the different physicochemical parameters, which are vital for the optimum growth and development of the fishes. So to give you a short um, backgrounder on what are the different hatchery requirements. So here we have um, the water quality and the hatchery design. And the efficient operation for the fish hatchery depends on several factors and one of which is water quality. Among these are suitable site selection, no? and uh, some, some sort of soil characteristics and water quality. And in, in this aspect, we will be focusing our attention on the water quality itself, uh, namely the different physical chemicals that are uh, significantly affecting the growth and development of our cultured species. Now, uh, among of which are the adequate facility design, water quality structures, water source, hatchery, uh, effluent treatment must also be considered. So uh, as mentioned, Water quality is just one, but a vital component in the successful operation of your hatchery. And in this chapter, we will be identifying um, the more important hatchery requirements and the conditions necessary for efficient operation. Now, in this in this lecture discussion, I have basically uh, divided the the lecture sessions that we will be having. And in this lecture discussion, we will be only focusing on the water quality which are the temperatures the dissolved oxygen namely the oxygen gas nitrogen gas carbon dioxide toxic gases and um dissolved gas criteria and we will also be discussing the suspended and dissolved solids including the acidity alkalinity hardness total dissolved solids and some of the toxic materials and we will also be touching some um a few informations about heavy metals salinity, turbidity, and pesticides that will basically be um, vital in the growth and development of our cultured species, right? So those are co our coverage for this lecture. Now, as a form of introduction, as I mentioned, um, the success and failure of, of our hatchery operations depends upon our knowledge depends upon on our knowledge on the water quality, namely the physical chemical characteristics of the water that is coming in to your hatchery. Now, what are those physical chemical um, parameters? These are basically first the temperature, the dissolved solids, uh, dissolved gases, pH, uh, mineral content, and toxic metals. And we will go through each one of these in the, in the, in the succeeding slides. So, Again, uh, the success and failure of the operations in your hatchery depends upon the knowledge or learnings about the water quality, uh, mostly about the physical chemi chemical um, properties of the water that, that is going into your hatchery facility. And um, let's first take a look at the temperature. Now, temperature is a vital component no it is no other uh, single factor that affects the development and growth of fish as much as the water temperature um meron man yung iba but uh, not as vital as the temperature um in, in this slide basically it shows that um among the the factors or the biological processes that is being affected by the temperature are spawning egg hatching, gonadal development, metabolism, and disease tolerance. And in this uh, figure, we could see that as the temperature increases, the metabolic rates also increases. No? As you might have noticed that uh, most of the fish are having a loss of appetite, no? anorexia, when, when the temperature is too low. Hindi masyado silang kumakain kapag uh, madilim yung paligid or uh, malamig yung tubig or etc. Et now, in the case of spawning, no? Uh, spawning basically varies between species and um, as for the egg hatching 20 to 24 are, are the desirable range but uh, there were uh, cases where 
29 degrees Celsius have recorded to be one of the optimum um, temperature requirement for the egg hatching for, for most or for few fishes. And gonadal development basically falls between 18 to 24 and 22 degrees Celsius is the best. And as I've mentioned earlier, metabolism increases as the temperature increases and the disease tolerance also is being affected by the change in temperature in the culture environment. So obviously, um, the disease tolerance of every species depends upon the optimal requirement of the species and also the pathogenic optimum requirement for that particular agent of disease. Now, here we have the effects of temperature variations. Now, one of the mandate or the purpose of establishing a hatchery is for the stocking program. Now, a stocking program like what the College of Fisheries is annually conducting every foundation day, they are conducting um, fish stocking and Lake Lanao. And the success and failure of that particular program depends upon the varying temperature between the hatchery and the Lake Lanao itself. Of course, uh, when there will be a significant variation or a significant difference between the temperature of the hatchery and the temperature of the Lake Lanao water, there will be a lower success. No? Maliit yung chance of survival ng mga inistock natin ng mga tilapias, for example. So, uh, really, the varying temperature between two bodies of water where the fish will be stuck from the fish that it, they came from basically defines the success of your stocking program to which that particular hatchery is directed, right? So that's first. Secondly, um, on the disease occurrence, no? obviously when you expose your fish to too low or too high temperature, which is basically above or below the optimum um, requirement of that particular fish, there will be a tendency that that fish will be stressed, no? Mas stress sila, and then eventually they will have to be susceptible to diseases. I know you're all familiar with this figure, no? This is basically the vein diagram of the disease um, occurrence. So here we have the host agent, the uh, pathogen agent, and the environmental factors. Once these three will overlap, there will be a disease occurrence in that particular manner. All right, and the next one is uh, the solubility of the chemical substances. Obviously, when you increase the temperature of the water, there will be a higher sol solubility of chemical substances. Now, why, why are we emphasizing this one? It's because uh, when you have more chemical substances being dissolved in the water, there will be a higher risk of your cultured species. So, so water has a higher solubility to chemical substances when it is at higher temperature. As you can see here in this figure, this is the solute at lower temperature. So as you can see, it is still compact. But when you expose them into higher temperature, this uh, solute will dissipate or dissolve in the aqueous solution that will basically harm your aquatic organisms since these chemical substances will bring um, adverse effect not just physiologically, but uh, to the growth itself, to the reproduction itself, the spawning and breeding and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Any other functions that will be altered by that particular uh, chemical substance. Now, lastly is the solubility of gases. Now, this is inversely proportional with the chemical substances. Unlike chemical substances that uh, it becomes soluble when exposed to a higher temperature, ito naman gases, gases will become less soluble at a higher temperature. So as you can see here in this figure, we have here two jars of lower temperature and a higher temperature. Uh, you could see the difference that there are a few gases that will diffuse into the aqueous solution at higher temperature, while there will be higher chances of gases that will be dissolved in lower temperature. So that's the principle of the chemical substances solubility and the solubility of gases into the aqueous phase with respect to the temperatures. And then here we have uh, the dissolved gases, no? talking about gases. We have the two most abundant gases dissolved in water. 
So first is the oxygen, second is the nitrogen, and there are trace elements of uh, carbon gases that is basically, when we say trace, uh, maliliit na mga proportions. No? Oxygen is uh, the gas that is dissolved in the water that the fishes are being absorbing and, and, and uh, DO directly from the water into the bloodstream through the gills of the fishes. And nitrogen is the nitrogen gas dissolved in the ocean is fixed by bacteria converted to other forms required for primary production, just nitrate and nitrate. And if you if you take a look at this, uh, there will be a higher um, what they call this higher proportions of nitrogen being dissolved in the water when compared to the oxygen. That, that's because nitrogen is is basically um more soluble than than the oxygen gases and the fact that nitrogen uh in the atmosphere is more abundant than the oxygen in the atmosphere so obviously it will be more uh uh dissolved nitrogen gases in the water and and uh if you could still remember no itong, uh, talking about nitrogen in in the nitrogen cycle there are specific organisms that converts this nitrogen into into other forms like nitrate and nitrate no nitrite and nitrate uh specifically yung mga nitrosomonas that converts ammonia to nitrite and then yung mga nitrobacter that converts nitrite to nitrate and then those nitrates will be readily available for for the consumption or for the absorption of most aquatic plants so there you have it the two uh, most abundant gases dissolved in the water and then uh, here in this figure you can see that uh, there is a differences between the solubility or the concentration rather the concentration of oxygen and the concentration of nitrogen with respect to the pure water and salt water so as mentioned there will be a higher concentration of nitrogen when compared to the concentration of oxygen and also there will be a higher concentration of nitrogen i mean uh both gases when when compared to the pure water when we say pure water this is a fresh water basically and then salt water so higher uh dissipation or uh what do we call this um higher diffusion of nitrogen gas in in freshwater environment when compared to the seawater environment. Same goes with the concentration of oxygen higher in the freshwater and lower in the freshwater. And again, more uh, concentrations of nitrogen when compared to oxygen. So I hope that's clear. And then here we have the effects, uh, the effects of DO to, to most aquatic organisms. Now, in this figure, this is taken from the book that I am uh, referencing no? uh, here we have the zero dissolved oxygen in terms of parts per million so that zero dissolved oxygen most small fish will survive at short exposure Maka survive yung mga small fish but in in short exposure only but uh, at the range of 0.3 to 1.0 ppm there will be a lethal if exposure is prolonged both small and i mean uh for those species that that has a regular sizes no and from one to five uh ppm fish survive but growth is slow for prolonged input exposure so so uh if we be break this down um at 0 0.3 fish will die to exposed long periods and 0.3 to 1 uh lethal fish lethal to fish ex ex if ex exposure is prolonged one to five fish will survive but uh grow slow for a prolonged exposure and the desirable range for for the fish no to have an optimum growth and reproduction for the concentration of dissolved oxygen is above 5.0 parts per million so there you have it and then um, there are different techniques or management techniques that is being uh, employed in the hatchery no especially when you deal with intensive aquaculture first is we have here the projection method the projection method basically is from the word project is to predict the minimum do consumption during the night so say for example at 8 pm no at 8 pm you have 
analyzed your dissolved oxygen concentration you could uh, you could do this by by titration or uh, by the use of uh, multi probe parameters no like this one this is a deometer if you have already uh, read it by 8 milligrams per liter and you have also an actual uh, measured value of 6 milligrams per liter at 11 pm no you have here the projected value at around uh, 6 a.m. No, so ito yung parang project projection method. Uh, gina analyze mo yung um, yung future uh, readings of your of your um, dissolved oxygen concentration in the aquatic environment. So that's first the projection method. Another one is flushing. No, obviously flushing is a vernacular term also. No? A flush. Flushing of high DO water into a low DO pond water is effective and inexpensive. Now, wala kang gagamiting device, wala kang i-introduce ng mga chemicals, and etc., etc. Provided an adequate what, uh, supply of high DO water is available. Sources of such water include nearby streams, wells, ponds, coastal areas. Flushing by gravity flow is at least expensive but not often available, especially when when uh your your area is flat no hindi parang uh sloping so flushing will be difficult on this one so this is an effective and inexpensive cheap um management technique in the solve oxygen management and then thirdly is the use of mechanical aerations now these are considered as emergency aerations especially when you deal with intensive um, hatchery management practices or in intensive uh, aquaculture um, method. So one of which is the use of paddle wheel, paddle wheel aerators. No? I, have, I, have, I know that you have already uh, seen one in the college, yung mga parang may boat na dalawa tapos may mga wheels. No? Yan yung paddle wheels. Circulates the splashes the water into the air generally considered the most effective and then another are uh, floating sprayer types this one no? mga sprayers and then air blowers and venturi uh, aerators so those are the different mechanical aerations that is being employed in the management of dissolved oxygen and then uh, when when cases no? there are cases that this dissolved gases are too saturated or too concentrated in in the culture environment now say for example in this figure uh you can see here that the fish have suffered the gas bubble disease no this one the fish has this uh parang mga bubbles in in its eye and in its tails and if we take a look at this histologically we can see there are empty spaces of um uh flesh of the fish this is due to the supersaturation levels of, of the nitrogen or either oxygen. This is basically taken from the work of F. Mark et al. 2010. And here we have another toxic gases. I mean, the toxic gases as the, sol the dissolved gases. And uh, there are two most popular toxic gases that is being employed in, in uh, employed and considered to be uh, very vital component to be very to must be controlled in in the hatchery uh, facility so the two are the hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen cyanide and if you take a look at the chemical structure of this one in 3d form this is it no sulfur and two um, atoms of hydrogens and hydrogen sulfide derives mainly from anaerobic decomposition of sulfur compounds and sediments in few parts per billion or lethal. No? Parang uh, nakakakos talaga kahit one part per billion lang tong concentration ng hydrogen sulfide into your uh, hatchery management system, there will be a higher tendency that there will be an occurrence of mortality. No? So this is a product of anaerobic decomposition. I know you're all familiar with anaerobic decomposition. And then another is hydrogen cyanide is a contaminant from several industrial processes and is toxic at concentrations of 0.1 part per million or less. So 
hydrogen cyanide. By the way, hydrogen sulfide is characterized as yung mga fouling smell like rotten eggs. No? And then uh, here we have the dissolved gases. So various fish species, as mentioned earlier, no? mga iba-iba yung requirements ng, ng species with regards or with respect to the temperature, uh, with respect to the dissolved oxygen tolerance, or with respect to the toxic substances tolerance. So various fish species have different tolerances to the dissolved gases as well. However, the following general guidelines to summarize the water quality features that will support the growth and survival of most or all of the fish species. So generally, these are the thresholds with respect to the different uh, criteria or the different dissolved gases criteria to the general uh, species of fin fish. So as for oxygen, we have far five parts per million or greater. Nitrogen is 100% saturation or less. Carbon dioxide is 10 parts per million or less. Hydrogen sulfide is 0.1 uh, rather, parts per million or less. Hydrogen cyanide is less than 10 parts per billion. So uh, as obviously um, emphasized earlier that uh, heavy metals or toxic gases are, are really lethal even in low concentration. So Hydrogen sulfide is expressed in one part per billion and uh, same goes with hydrogen cyanide. And so in general, oxygen concentration should be near 100% saturation in the incoming water supply to the hatchery. A continual con uh, concentration of 80% or more saturation provides desirable oxygen supply. And uh, in cases where there will be, no, hindi mo talaga may iwasan na uh, uh, yung temperature, yung oxygen, is not at optimum level, there will be an um, intervention. No? Like for example, kung ang source ng water supply mo is too cold, there will be an intervention in the hatchery wherein the incoming water will be will be subjected to heater, no? Iinit para uh, mag-correspond siya doon sa uh, optimum requirement ng fish species being cultured in the facility. And same goes with the uh, dissolved oxygen concentration. Kapag low yung DO ng source water mo, there will be uh, mechanical aerations or um, uh, parang conditioning unit or conditioning uh, tanks para in, in improve yung concentrations of the dissolved oxygen and then uh, para mag-equal na siya sa requirement ng fish in that particular facility. Now, here we have the suspended and dissolved solids. No? Uh, the suspended and dissolved solids, solids in, in the water leave tangible residues when the water is filtered or evaporated to dryness. So uh, basically, this will also define the transparency of the water or the turbidity of the water itself. So in this figure, you can see that the sunlight is 100% uh, could penetrate towards the bottom of the water. And uh, in, in cases where there will be a higher uh, suspension of suspended solids, there will be a 60% um, transparency. And you can see the difference there. No, uh, The production of aquatic plants is higher. No? Mas maraming leaves ito kumpara dito because the photosynthesis is being is being um, employed or processed well. No, Kasi maraming sunlight as a source of energy. And then here, limited sunlight only. And also, it will directly reflect on the biomass of the fish being produced in that particular aqu aquatic system. And then, uh, when we compare the suspended solids and dissolved solids, the difference is that the suspended solids make the water cloudy or opaque. They include chemical precipitates, fluctuated organic matter, no? flocculated, meaning to say, um, if you're familiar with the biofloc, no? it is basically the introduction of uh, some... Uh, starter bacteria with um, that are beneficial bacteria that will eventually be a source of food to the organisms, to the cultured organisms. So that's why we call it bioflock because the flock that are being produced are living organisms that will be eventually be a source of food for your cultured organisms, which are the, sometimes shrimps or fish. And then living and dead planktonic organisms and sediment steered up to the bottom or the pond or stream or raceway. 
So those are suspended solids. It will always make your water cloudy or opaque or turbid. And then uh, when we compare it to dissolved solids, may color uh, the dissolved solids may color the water but leave it clear and transparent. They include anything in a true solution. So uh, that's the two major difference between suspended solids and dissolved solids. And uh, talking about suspended particulates uh, or suspended solids, here we have the term turbidity. No? I know you're all familiar with turbidity. The term turbidity is associated with the presence of suspended solids. And analytically, turbidity refers to the penetration of light through the water, lesser the penetration and great um, turbidity. But the word is used less formally to imply concentrations, weight of the solids per weight of the water. So sometimes in cases where your source of water are, are really turbid or uh, there are lots of suspended solids, there will be uh, occurrence or there will be cases where your fish will suffer from um, less or suffocation or parang tinatawag natin na uh, anorexia, no? Parang less, ay anorexia bang tawag doon? Or hypoxia, hypoxia rather. Hypoxia meaning to say limited oxygen supply because of the less production of photosynthesis and less production of um, oxygen through, through the process of photosynthesis and apart from that there will be also a high risk of clogging into your your water pipes and filtration systems and among others no the mga problems that will arise especially when you have that um source of turbid water and then here we have another dissolved chemicals naman tayo so dissolved chemicals uh specifically acidity acidity refers to the ability of Dissolved chemicals to donate hydrogen ions, the chemical measure of acidity is pH, and the negative algorithm of hydrogen ion activity. So uh, in the natural environment, the pH is ranged from 1 to 14. The lower the number, the greater the acidity, of course. A pH value of 7 is neutral, and that is they are the they are as many donors of hydrogen ions and acceptor solution. So in, in the aquaculture context, no, this is the pH. I know you're you're wondering why uh ano yang p ano yang h so that is a French term for poisons of the hydrogen which means the power of strength of the hydrogen so that hints the the word pH so as you can see here uh the lower the pH value the more acidic it is the higher the pH value the more basic it is so the neutral is around seven so that is the principles of the pH uh range with respect to the acidity or alkalinity. And then uh, there are different um, tools or kits that are being employed or being used in the aquaculture facility. And in my case, I have used this particular paper strip, no? uh, a universal, universal indicator of the, of the pH in the water. So basically you just have to um submerge this strip and then compare it kung saan banda siya mag mag fall kung saan siya, siya banda mag magpakapareha yun yung um scale ng pH ng water so there you have it and uh for for uh, some of this these are basically self explanatory no uh please read this one and um same with this one. And let's proceed to alkalinity and hardness. Alkalinity and hardness imply similar things about water quality, but they are represent different types of measurements. So when we differentiate them, alkalinity refers to the ability to accept hydrogen ions and is direct counterpart of acidity, acidity as, as, as what we have mentioned a while ago. An ion negatively charged uh, are, are bases involved mainly are carbonate and bicarbonate ions. Alkalinity refers to these alone and, and is expressed in terms of equivalent concentrations of calcium carbonate. So how does this, uh, how does the water become alkaline or hard? No? So here we have the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is mixed in the water or aqueous solution and forming into um, bicarbonate. No? Uh, hydrogen carbonate and then forming into bicarbonate because of the low pH concentrations. 
and then uh, this bicarbonate will then once again uh, mix or react with the calcium ions that is present in the aquatic environment forming into calcium carbonate substances and carbonate substances and sometimes these carbonate substances are being deposited in rocks or shells of of the crustaceans so that's how the alkalinity and hardness uh being directed upon into the aquatic environment and then uh, the water hardness is being uh, measured through different um kits no may mga kits pa din na mga ginagamit to measure the water hardness and then um some more informations about hardness and alkalinity please please read this one and then let's proceed to the total dissolved solids no the dissolved solids and salinity sometimes are used interchangeably but incorrectly the total dissolved solids in the water are represented by the weight of the residue left when the water is sample has been evaporated to dryness the sample have already been filtered to remove the suspended solids. This value is not the same as salinity, which is the concentration of the only certain cations and anions water. So the total dissolved solids are, are basically one of the vital components, especially when you assess for a suitability of your cultured species. Say, for example, you are planning to have um, Norwegian mariculture in that certain facility or certain body of water and then there will be a higher uh, total dissolved solids in that area so there will be a tendency that it will fall to a non-suitable for your particular fish that basically because um, yung mga to total dissolved solids will, will aggregate and then hamper your uh, the exchange of the water between the outside environment and to your inside Norwegian culture. So parang fouling organism na siya. And um, here we have the toxic materials. No? Toxic materials includes industrial and agricultural pollutions or our sources of cheap um, heavy metals and pesticides. So uh, as much as possible, we, we will allocate or situate our hatcheries away from this industrial and agricultural pollutions not just our hatcheries itself but the sources of our water to be uh, introduced in the hatchery and then the heavy metals there are a wide range of reported values of toxicity of the heavy metals to fish and among which are are the zinc copper and cadmium which will kill 50 percent of the population within the range of 94 hours ranging from 90 to 400 uh, 40,900 parts per billion for the zinc and 46 to 10,000 ppb for copper and 470 to 9,000 ppb for cadmium. And the sources of this um, heavy metals includes the power plants, biomedical waste, industrial influence, influence meaning to say mga, um, mga agents of, of chemicals. No? And then Minings, electroplating, uh, electronic waste and e-waste, uh, battery, no? agricultural activities and volcanic eruptions are some of the sources for heavy metals. And then here we have the salinity. No? Uh, the salinity is one of the vital components, especially when you deal with uh, fin fish no? and some of the trends of the researches nowadays are on the acclimatization of some uh, marine fish to brackish or from marine to brackish and um, vice versa. All salts in the solution change physical and chemical nature of the water and exert osmotic pressure. Some have physiological or toxic effects as well. In both marine fish, freshwater fishes, adaptations to salinity are necessary. So uh, if you take a look at in this figure, there will be uh, the marine fish tend to lose water, no? To the environment by diffusion of the water bodies consequently um they lose water uh, they actually drink water and get rid of the excess salt by way of special uh, specialized salt excreting cells so get rid of the salt kapag uh, actively drink water and then get rid of the salt and uh, basically discharges the water from from the gills while conversely the Freshwater fishes take in water and very active excrete, very actively excrete 
large amount of water in the form of urine and kidneys. And here is a more, no, a more or uh, elaborated example of how the osmotic and ionic uh, regulation of fish. I have um, required you in your task uh, three, task three in the Google Classroom on the explanation of osmotic and ionic regulation of fish. So what's the difference between the fresh water and salt water? And some more uh, water quality criteria for salmonid fish. So as you can see here, uh, there are different um, levels of upper concentration or upper limit concentration of, of the different uh, chemicals with respect to the salmonid fish. So that's will that will be one of your references. And then turbidity. Turbidity or clay turbidity in the natural waters rarely exceeds 20,000 parts per million. Water considered muddy usually contain less 2,000 parts per million. Turbidity seldom directs effects in fish may adversely affect the production by smothering fish, eggs, and destroying the benthic organisms and ponds. And it is also uh, restricts light penetration thereby limiting the photosynthesis and production of desirable planktons that will serve as feed, feed for your aquatic organism. And here are some suggested chemical values for hatchery and water supplies. So take a look at that. And then lastly, the pesticides. So many pesticides are extremely toxic to fish in low parts per billion range. Acute toxicity, when you say acute toxicity, meaning to say a short period, no, but a higher concentration. Acute toxicity values may, for many, Commonly used insecticide range from 5 to 100 micrograms per liter. Much lower concentrations may be toxic upon extended exposure. Even if the fish are not killed outright, long-term damage to fish populations may occur in environment contaminated with pesticides. Like, for example, uh, it will hamper the, uh, the growth, the reproduction, the spawning, and uh, breeding, or etc., etc. The abundance of food organisms may decrease fry and eggs may die uh, growth rates of the fish may be declined and pesticides sprayed into fields may drift over the considerable areas and reach the ponds and streams and eventually will reach the hatcheries if watershed receive heavy applications of pesticides ponds usually are not suitable for fish production so this is one of the criteria for selection of um areas for hatchery so that concludes our uh, module two no and i hope that everybody have already um stay tuned up to this moment and with regards to your uh task okay so here we have the water quality no in your task you have here you are tasked to um, differentiate or explain how does the water temperature affect the growth performance of the fish, the growth and development, and then how enumerate and briefly explain the management techniques of for optimal dissolved oxygen requirements and compare contrast suspended solids and dissolved solids, differentiate water alkalinity and hardness, explain the osmotic and ionic regulation of freshwater and marine water fish. So this is basically um, all present in the slides and some of which are explained during the lecture discussion. So again, thank you very much for joining up to this moment of the lecture and I hope to see you again in the next video.